Okay, ji, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, dear students of uh, parts of Central Asia. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, Turkmenistan, uh, which is uh, again a very significant country as far as energy security is concerned. And it's a very important country and located in a very peculiar position in Central Asia. Uh, though it's a landlocked state, uh, but uh, it possesses huge, huge hydrocarbon resources, which makes this country a very important player in future energy security, not only in this region, but also beyond this region. For example, the Chinese are dependent on Turkmen gas. Uh, India, Pakistan, for example, from South Asia, we are dependent on um, Turkmen gas. Uh, European countries, they are eager to get, you know, um, this uh, particular gas from Turkmenistan. And uh, the other other states beyond this, uh, they are also involved in this. So basically, Turkmenistan uh, is a very you know strategically located country. Uh, I told you before that this is a landlocked state, but despite that, it possesses huge huge hydrocarbon resources, which makes it uh, this country an important player in the global energy security. So they got independence in '91 um, after the dismemberment of uh, the Soviet Union. And um, this country uh, became independent after that. But um, uh, the politically, this country has been an authoritarian regime uh, since then. And they have been uh, disconnected with the, um, uh, with the powers, international powers, and uh, they had their closed foreign policy. Uh, because of that, they could not, uh, you know, uh, they could not uh, develop. So despite having huge, huge resources, this country is still, uh, not considered as a developed country. Uh, so Turkmenistan's constitution establishes permanent neutrality as the core principle of uh, country's foreign policy, but uh, still they got influence of other states like Russia, like China, like United States of America. So some way or the other, these countries influence their foreign policy, their um, overall policy. So uh, this was just a backgrounder of um, uh, this particular country. <laughs> Um, history and geography underpin a difficult but important relationship with Russia because Russia has been a key player uh, in this region. As I told you before, uh, that Russia is politically dominating this country, this area, for example, Central Asia. So uh, they have got difficult relationship with Russia, but they have got a very good ties with China. And these ties are basically, um, you can say, governed with, with um, economic dependence because China uh, is a very, uh, you know, huge uh, country. They need more and more resources from other states. So Turkmenistan is no different for China because uh, China looks towards Turkmenistan for hydrocarbon resources, especially gas. And that's the reason that China has, uh, you know, provided them huge loans. And because of those, uh, Turkmenistan is dependent economically on China. In recent years, U.S. cooperation with Turkmenistan has focused primarily on border security issues, particularly with the neighboring Afghanistan, because Turkmenistan share border with Afghanistan and the spillover effect of Afghanistan are obvious. And that's the reason that uh, America is very much concerned about it, that uh, Turkmenistan must improve its border security to uh, protect any spillover effects of Afghanistan. So basically, this country is also uh, significant for you know, uh, countries like Pakistan and India, you know, South Asian countries. As you can see in this map as well, uh, the pipeline which is going to take place from um, Turkmenistan, TAPI, and then uh, other pipeline which is going to connect China. So China is also important for Turkmenistan and Turkmenistan is important for China, vice versa. And the, you know, other pipelines which are, you know, already going there, uh, to uh, China, and then uh, they are also developing a few pipelines which are going to be Trans-Caspian pipelines, and they are going to ensure energy security in the European countries. So basically, um, some of the pipeline of Turkmenistan passed through um, Russia, and some of them passed through Iran as well. Uh, so China, uh, basically Turkmenistan, is dependent on uh, these regional countries like Center, uh, like uh, Russia and Iran for the supply of their gas to other countries in the world. So basically, uh, it's a landlocked state. Uh, we have already discussed uh, it uh, share border with Turkmen, Uzbekistan, 
it share a significant border with Kazakhstan. It has also got a key share in the Caspian Sea region, which we have already discussed that uh, this region is important for a uh, huge hydrocarbon resources. And this region is also considered as the new Persian Gulf because of the presence of huge uh, oil and gas resources. Turkmenistan also share a very significant border with Iran, which is uh, a Persian Gulf uh, state, Middle Eastern power, and then uh, a, a, you know, a important border with Afghanistan uh, because of Afghanistan's instability and turmoil, this border is not considered as a friendly border. This is a hostile border for Turkmenistan because of the spillover effect of uh, militancy from Afghanistan. So uh, basically, uh, Turkmenistan um, is a landlocked state, and because of that, they have uh, you know few options to supply their energy to the other powers in the world. So that's why uh, they are dependent on Afghanistan for TAPI, they are dependent on Iran, they are dependent on uh, you know, these countries like Azerbaijan, and then from uh, on the uh, Russians uh, to supply their gas to the European markets and others. So because of the um, Turkmen um, gas and oil and gas resources, this country um, is significant uh, country uh, in the, on the global map for energy security in future. So it is uh, not a major country. It's not a big country. Uh, it, it has a land area of about 188,000 square kilometer. And most of this area, 80% of the area is desert area. And their population is also close to 6 million uh, people. It is not, uh, I have to change this. This is not a correct one. The updated uh, population is 6 million. Uh, and uh, their labor force is uh, not more than 2 million. So basically it's a small country. Um, with small population, um, that's the one of the reasons that their economy is suffering because they don't have huge labor force, skilled labor force like China. So here you can see in this map that um, the, 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 the desert which I told you before, the Karakum Desert, it is the 80% of Turkmenistan, as you can see. So a huge, huge area of Turkmenistan is consists of desert. Uh, so that's the, one of the reasons that in desert areas you can find more and more gas as you can see in Pakistan as well, in Balochistan, and you can see in China, for example, the Xinjiang province, um, they have also got huge resources. So um, if you look at the ethnic, major ethnic groups in uh, Turkmenistan, 85% uh, of the, Turkmen, uh, uh, the people in um, Turkmenistan are Turkmen, the locals, and 5% are Uzbek, the neighboring country. And 4% are Russians, uh, those who are living there uh, since long, and many others. Um, about 150,000 ethnic Turkmen reside elsewhere in the former Soviet Union in other states um, like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and others. Approximately 1.3 million uh, they are in Iran and uh, over 900,000 in Afghanistan. So basically this uh, uh, particular ethnic group uh, is uh, spread over all over the region. So Turkmenistan's uh, constitution defines the country as a secular, democratic, presidential republic. Uh, apparently, it's a democracy, but it is not a democracy. It is uh, authoritarian regime is there, and they're controlling everything in um, uh, that particular country. And um, with a triple uh, separation of power between the executive, judiciary, and the legislature, uh, in practice, executive power is largely unchecked, and president um, Gurbanguli, uh, Bardi Mahmadov uh, actually dominates the country's political structure. So he is the person who is all in all in Turkmenistan, the president. Um, Bardi Mahmadov was elected in a, a 2007 election, widely seen as a fraudulent, and these elections, you know, they are controlled elections actually. And he was re-elected in 2012. And again in 2017, the presidential term was extended from five to seven years. And there is no constitutional limit on the number of terms a president can hold office. So this shows that the political system in Turkmenistan is totally controlled by one party. And with the introduction of constitutional amendments in 2016, there is no longer an upper age limit for presidential candidates. Yani ke wo 65, 60, he can serve until he lives. 90 years, 100 years, doesn't matter. 
Um, so although the initially introduced uh, uh, modest reforms, Mamadov ne kuch uh, apni reforms introduced karwai, has largely followed in his predecessor's author authoritarian footstep. Jo se pehle tha Neozov, uh, he was also very authoritarian uh, person and he controlled, uh, you know, Aturkmanistan strictly. Um, he has moved the dismantle, uh, to dismantle Neozov's cult of personality, replacing it with veneration of himself. So, Neozov was also very powerful and he was uh, controlling everything in uh, Turkmenistan. So, when he took over, uh, he also, you know, uh, controlled things in his own way. He called himself as a protector of Turkmenistan. Basically, um, now he is, uh, you know, many people believe that now he is going to uh, replace uh, his son uh, and his son would, uh, you know, control things in future. So basically, it, it's kind of monarchy which is going on there in Turkmenistan. So uh, his son, Sardar, uh, he is also deputy chairman of the government. So he may replace um, this particular president in future. So if you analyze the legislature of Turkmenistan, the Majlis, uh, it has a one for 25 seat unicameral you know, parliament in which you know, uh, president is the most powerful person. So this Majlis is elected for five years uh, and this is all, this whole process is actually control process. And following 2012 um, legislation, allowing for a multi-party system, Turkmenistan now has three officially recognized political parties. And uh, that is the Democratic Party, which was established in 91, soon after the dismemberment of Soviet Union. And um, this party actually dominates everything in Turkmenistan. The second party, which was registered in 2012, uh, is uh, consist of industrialists and entrepreneurs. And the third party, which registered itself in 2014, is Agrarian Party. Uh, they are actually, they are controlled, they are aligned with the policies of the president of Turkmenistan and they are totally controlled by the president. So there is no, uh, you can say, um, uh, control over, uh, any other control over, over these parties. They are not independent, they are not um, pursuing their independent goals, but they are, they have policies aligned with the president of the Turkmenistan. So this uh, person, uh, president uh, uh, the uh, Guru Bangoli uh, Bardi Mahmadov is the president now, right now, and he's serving since long after the death of you know uh, the previous one. Um, he is also closely aligned with the Russian uh, president uh, Vladimir Putin, and since long uh, they are you know uh, sharing their thoughts. Uh, the president has extensive powers, as I told you before, and uh, it includes presiding over the cabinet of ministers. So. He is the person who control everything, the policy making and everything, and uh, all the ministries are under him. As well as appointing and dismissing regional governors and mayors. So he also got the authority to dismiss anyone. Although the constitution stipulates the independence of judiciary, the president also appoints uh, and dismisses judges. So the constitution says that independent judiciary will but he has the authority to appoint and dismiss judges. So, which is, uh, you know, um, uh, which is a clear cut depiction towards the authoritarian regime. So, let's move forward. And uh, this authoritarian rule actually um, started with Sapar Murad Niazov, who was the first president of Turkmenistan after the dismemberment of Soviet Union. And Sapar Murad Nayazov, uh, he was, uh, he became the president after an uncontested 1992 race. Um, a 1994 referendum extended his term to 2002. And in 1999, amendments to the constitution proclaimed him president for life. So this was uh, the, you know, uh, thing, political things were going on in uh, Turkmenistan. And he, he had the backing of Russia at that time. And because of that, um, he passed, you know, he brought amendments in the constitution without any problem. So he became president for life, uh, but he died in 2006. Niazo was an autocratic ruler uh, who created a cult of personality around himself and his family isolated the country and suppressed dissent. 
So they strictly control things in Turkmenistan. And no one can speak anything ill or against about Niyazov and his policies. Following Niyazov's un unexpected death in 2006, uh, the deputy chairman of the cabinet of ministers, Gurbenguli, became the president of Turkmenistan uh, with the Ashirwad of Russia and other states in the region. And in uh, Turkmenistan, uh, all media outlets in Turkmenistan, they are state controlled mostly. And many NGOs, they believe that uh, there is systematic harassment of few independent journalists who are working there. In 2020, World Press Freedom Index reports without freedom, uh, without border ranked Turkmenistan, 179th out of 180 countries in levels of freedom available to journalists. So this is the level of, you know, a freedom of uh, journalism in Turkmenistan. Internet censorship is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, common and the government blocks access to many websites uh, which are against uh, the interest of the Turkmenistan, for example. So basically there is no freedom for uh, media because uh, in authoritarian regimes, media outlets and all these things are, you know, uh, meaningless. Um, now, if you look at, let's quickly look at the economy of Turkmenistan. The economy of Turkmenistan uh, primarily uh, is dependent on natural gas, as I told you before, hydrocarbon, because they possess um, a huge, huge uh, hydrocarbon resources. They are the fourth largest country with the hydrocarbon resources of natural gas, for example. And hydrocarbon exports actually account for about 25% of their GDP. So they are totally dependent on natural gas. But at the same time, they have also developed their um, agriculture sector, especially in the cotton. And they are the seventh largest country in the world of in the cotton uh, production. So that, that's also a also very important sector in Turkmenistan. So 8% of Turkmenistan GDP um, is uh, you know, coming from uh, cotton and it employs almost half of the country's workforce. So there is also allegation on Turkmenistan that they actually carry out forced labor in Turkmenistan and they uh, pressurize the people to join cotton industry and work for the state. So if you look at the hydrocarbon resources of Turkmenistan, you will find uh, they possess huge, huge oil and gas. Oil is uh, uh, small in small quantity, but gas is in huge quantity in Turkmenistan. And uh, their uh, gas exports are also increasing with the passage of time. And uh, as you can see in, uh, in current situation, uh, in last three, it was um, 1,600 billion cubic feet, so which is uh, huge. And the, uh, the large portion, the large chunk of natural gas um, goes to China and then uh, Turkey and others, but primarily most of their gas um, recipient country is China because China, uh, as I told you before, it's a major economy. Uh, it's economy, second largest economy. It's uh, 1.41 billion population, maybe 44 billion population. So they need more and more resources to sustain their economic growth. So Turkmenistan is lucrative for China. So that's why Chinese are importing um, gas from um, Turkmenistan. So 34% of their gas uh, requirements they fulfill from Turkmenistan, which is you know very important for them as you can see the pipelines which uh, go from um, china to Turkmenistan uh, china has uh, also uh, helped Turkmenistan in the development of this infrastructure with eight billion dollars of you know uh, funds so these things are very important other important thing in Turkmenistan as i told you before is the cotton industry Soviet industrialization policies established a cotton monoculture in the country. And uh, after that, this country developed this particular industry. Um, and Turkmenistan remains among the world's top 10 producers of cotton, which is primarily grown for export. The country's other major crop wheat is cultivated for domestic market, but cotton is produced for the external market. And foreign direct investment is limited outside of the hydrocarbon sector. But here in this particular area, foreign direct investment is not allowed. Turkmenistan is seventh largest uh, producer of uh, cotton in the world, as I told you before. 
but the problem is um, that uh, most of the you know um, labor force you can say they are f forcefully they are uh, you know they are asked to work in the cotton industry so that is something which is creating um, a problem for Turkmenistan in the other areas uh, in 2019, uh, the target was to achieve uh, 1.5 million tons of cotton, and in 2020, uh, they achieved 1.25 million tons of you know cotton, which is uh, definitely uh, uh, helping their economy. But um, uh, still, they are suffering because of the widespread corruption and nepotism and all these things. Now, let's quickly uh, analyze now the very important part of this lecture: the energy politics in the region and future, in future, and how Turkmenistan is working in this particular um, competition, for example. Turkmenistan is estimated to have the fourth largest natural gas reserves in the world, as I told you before, which is 10% of the global total. Uh, the country's export capacity is limited by infrastructural defi deficiencies. Why? Because they are landlocked state, and to export their commodity, for example, natural gas, they are dependent on, on the regional countries like Afghanistan, like Iran, like uh, Azerbaijan from Caspian Sea region, like for example, other, other states uh, like Russia and others. So basically that is the major problem for Turkmenistan. And they are now aiming for a Trans-Caspian gas pipeline. Uh, this is also in, uh, in pipeline. And this particular project, uh, if it is completed in on time, by 2023, this project is going to change the you know life of Turkmenistan. Uh, why? Because uh, this took uh, this particular gas pipeline would pass through uh, all the way from Turkmenistan and, and it would enter Azerbaijan uh, from Baku. It is going to connect the European countries later on. So this particular pipeline is very important. But Iran and Russia they are raising their voices over this particular project. So we'll discuss that in future in coming slides. So this is the idea of a Trans-Caspian pipeline, which is going to take place in future, and um, it is still in in negotiation process. <clears throat> and this is a very good, uh, important project for the Turkmen. Other important project for Turkmen Turkmenistan is TAPI, uh, which is going to uh, connect uh, Turkmenistan with Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. So this is also a very important project, which is going to connect Turkmenistan with South Asia, actually. So, but because of the instability and turmoil in Afghanistan, this project is also in limbo and uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, taking time in the completion. Uh, so once Afghanistan is stable and hopefully it would be stable in coming years. So automatically uh, this project is going to help Afghanistan, Pakistan and India in overcoming their energy problems. Uh, Turkmenistan national gas reserves and dependence on other states is uh, one of the major issues which we have already discussed. Turkmenistan has uh, uh, enormous gas reserves, which is estimated at 13.4 trillion cubic feet meters. And it is generally ranked uh, fourth behind Russia, Iran, and Qatar. So Russia, Iran, and Qatar, they are also um, you know, uh, countries which uh, possess huge amount of gas. Uh, the country's oil reserves estimated at 600 million barrel, which is a small amount of, uh, you know, resources. The country has an announced plans to increase gas production to 230 billion cubic meters per year by 2030, which makes this country an important country for Europeans, for Chinese, for India, for Pakistan, and for the other countries in the region. So that is the idea behind. But the problem with uh, Turkmenistan is, uh, the transit countries or the countries which are uh, there uh, in the region. And Afghanistan, uh, Turkmenistan need support of these countries. Like for example, they have got now three export options, Russia, Iran, and Afghanistan. So the first, um, 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 you can say, route for Turkmen gas is the Russian route. And because uh, Turkmenistan is, was a landlocked state and it is a landlocked state, it is wholly dependent on the you know transit countries, especially the uh, Russians. So Russians developed Central Asia uh, you know um, uh, center system, which transport Turkmenistan's gas to Russia and Gazprom distribution center. Gazprom, um, as we all know, that there's a Russian company and it's a very dominant, uh, you can say, giant in the oil and gas sector. 
So when Turkmenistan first declared its independence, officials in Moscow considered it their due uh, right that the country's gas would move to market via old Soviet era pipeline structure at prices that suited Moscow rather than Turkmenistan. So this, this was, you know, dichotomy in that particular thing because the Turkmenistan, they were dependent on the this particular area. Uh, to supply their gas by, uh, to the uh, other states. So the uh, Soviet era uh, CSE pipeline system actually um, connected uh, this particular uh, Turkmenistan uh, with the Russians and they were totally dependent on Russia at that time. So Russia used to take uh, gas on cheaper rates and uh, sell it on the higher rates in future. So this trade was conducted on a half cash, half barter basis on terms set by the Russia's Gazprom, which was, in, you know, uh, injustice for Turkmenistan. In 97, Turkmenistan cut off gas supplies in protest of these terms because they were not getting the benefit. So payment terms began to change in 2003 when Gazprom and Turkmenistan formalized an agreement that the Republic would continue to supply gas to Russian company through, um, you know, 2028. And, but the prices would be negotiated annually. Her sal prices would be changed. That would be closer to the purchase price in Europe. <clears throat> so in this way, Turkmenistan would get a benefit. The other route is through Afghanistan uh, to Pakistan and India. Pakistan and India, as we already discussed, we are a country of about 220 million and India is a country of about you know 1.39 billion. So uh, these countries are seriously facing energy shortage. And because of this particular route um, through Afghanistan, automatically Pakistan and India would get the benefit. And Afghanistan would also get the benefit because they also need um, uh, cheaper gas. But the problem is in Afghanistan, um, is the problem is uh, the instability and turmoil, urbanization and other issues which are going there, going on there. And um, once this issue is resolved, automatically this particular pipeline is going to, going to be uh, a heaven for Pakistan and India. <clears throat> and of course, for the South Asian countries. So I'll send you the link again. Uh, please join uh, that link and let's complete this lecture in the next few minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat>